Thank you very much indeed again, Andy, for asking me to give this talk. I, I've never delivered this talk in Bristol before, um, and I think maybe you'll understand um, for obvious reasons uh, why not. Um, I think what I want to say is that what everybody sees as the historical events surrounding Bristol are actually still relevant today, um, but I'll leave that as a question mark um, and you can decide for yourselves. If you actually put the term clinical governance into PubMed, uh, with inverted commas around it, um, you'll find that there are no papers um, that contain the phrase clinical governance published in the medical literature prior to 1998. 1998 was the year the GMC um, found uh, three doctors guilty of serious professional misconduct um, and struck two of them off the medical register. And the medical profession was having to deal with uh, accountability uh, outside of clinical freedom. Uh, and I think if you hear the story, you'll begin to understand why it was that we needed to go through that transition. These are the three doctors. Um, one was the chief executive, John Roylance. The other was the senior paediatric cardiac surgeon, who was James Wishart. And he was also the medical director of the hospital. And the third was Janardan Dasmana, who was the junior paediatric surgeon, who wasn't struck off. He was um, found guilty of serious professional misconduct um, and ordered to retrain in paediatric cardiac surgery. The issues around relevance, I think, are our professional responses to what we might consider to be standards of medical practice that do not necessarily meet our own standards. Um, and I think that when I, what I hope to cover yesterday about the ways in which we make those judgments must be made on good ethical and professional grounds. I think the culture of the profession must be transparent uh, and has to have the patient um, as at its core. And if there is information that we're told we're not allowed to give the patient, I think it's important that we know why it is that we're not allowed to share with the patient some of the information around outcomes and prognosis. In terms of incident reporting, I think it's important and I think it continues to be important. And my feeling is um, that if it's less than 5% of, of the total number of incidents in the UK NHS, for me, that would be something that needed urgently dealing with. And it's something that we as the profession have to begin to drive because it improves the outcome for patients. And the last thing I would say, and I think it interdigitates with what Phil Hammond was telling us, is that actually whistleblowers are important in the health service. And in fact, they may be invaluable in terms of improving outcomes for our patients. The story for me uh, started um, in the 1980s. And I didn't realise until data was made available to the public inquiry that actually the two Royal Colleges, the Royal College of Surgeons and the Royal College of Physicians, recommended in 1980 that every paediatric cardiac surgeon in the UK should operate on 50 um, open heart surgery cases under one year of age each year. And the idea was that they had to do at least one per week in order to maintain their competence. And when they set up this ruling through the recommendations of a working party, they also said that there would be annual assessment of results and an annual review of surgeons. In fact, the annual review spread out into a three-year review, and we'll look at some of the results of some of the three-year reviews that occurred after the nomination of Paediatric Cardiac Surgical Centres of Excellence, which occurred in 1983. In fact, Bristol was probably not up to um, the standard of a centre of excellence uh, for paediatric cardiac surgery when these centres were named in 1983. Prior to 1983, Bristol hadn't provided the number of operations that were needed, and you can see that they'd only really been achieving about a fifth of the number of cases that they needed to do for that minimum of 50 open heart operations each year for each surgeon under one year of age. And at the time, Bristol only had one paediatric cardiac surgeon, uh, but there really probably wasn't enough work for them to be nominated as a centre of excellence. In fact, at that time, when Bristol was designated, Sir Terence English, who was on the College Council at the Royal College of Surgeons, but wasn't at that time the president, 
said that he would endeavour to strengthen the unit, um, and that provided enough evidence for Norman Halliday uh, to suggest that this actually was going to be okay, um, and Norman Halliday was the secretary to the Super Regional Services Advisory Group, which was the group that set up the Centres of Excellence and then monitored their performance. After designation, Bristol still failed to achieve the number of cases that it should have been doing. That 50 cases per year, one per week, was really not achieved for the first few years. Um, and even when they uh, achieved two surgeons in 1986, the second surgeon, Janard and Dasmana, was appointed, the number of operations was still half the number that one surgeon would have been doing. And uh, in his evidence to the GMC inquiry, Mr. Dasmana said that he believed that in 1986, when he was appointed, Bristol was still at a very low primitive level, really. Um, and that was in terms of the pediatric cardiac surgery that they were carrying out. In fact, in 1986, a working party reviewed the work of all of the paediatric cardiac surgical centres, uh, and we can see from the data here uh, that Bristol was still known, even in 1986, to be underachieving with respect to open heart surgery cases under one year of age. Um, and this should have been uh, a warning or an indicator to the Super Regional Services Advisory Group that maybe there was an issue with the way in which Bristol was either receiving referrals or was handling its cases. In fact, um, in 1983, um, Norman Halliday had said that he knew Bristol did not shine as a star. Uh, and in 1986, he had read the Working Party report um, on low throughput at Bristol. And in the same year, he was approached by the Chief Medical Officer for Wales, who was Professor Gareth Crompton. He'd been warned by his cardiologists in Wales uh, that they were concerned about the results in Bristol. Um, and uh, so Professor Gareth Crompton approached Sir Donald Aitchison, who was the Chief Medical Officer for England, and Sir Donald Aitchison said, oh, if you're worried about paediatric cardiac surgery, the person to speak to is Norman Halliday. He's Chairman of the Super Regional Services Advisory Committee. And so Prof Crompton spoke to Norman Halliday and said, I'm worried about Bristol. My cardiologists don't seem to like referring there because they think the children don't do very well. So Norman Halliday asked him if he had any data. And he said, no, I've got no data. I've just got these concerns. And I thought you ought to know about them. And so there was no real grounds. Uh, Norman Halliday said he knew of the concerns, but there was no data on quality. So he decided that it was probably best not to take any action. In fact, Cardiff and Plymouth in 1986 both took their own action. And what Cardiff did was they contacted a paediatric cardiologist in Southampton and asked if they could send their cases directly to the Wessex region and bypass the Southwest region, which was their natural referral center. And the paediatric cardiologist in um, Southampton agreed that that would be fine and he accepted they made arrangements to receive these extra regional referrals and what it meant was that children from Cardiff were driving around the Bristol Ring Road in order to get to their paediatric cardiology appointments in Southampton and in the same year um, the pa paediatricians in Plymouth set up exactly the same extra regional referral system in order to get their children to Southampton because they believed that the results in Bristol were not as good as they could be. And what this meant was that the numbers in Bristol continued to remain low. Even in 87 and 88, the years after the 1986 review, the numbers were not enough to sustain one surgeon, let alone to sustain two. And this was the unit that I was appointed to in September 1988. In 1989, there was a second working party report, report uh, for paediatric cardiac surgery. And these were actually um, the, the illustrated figures that came from that report. Uh, and the figure um, on the left is essentially a bar graph of the numbers of operations being carried out in various centers. And the two lowest centres were Bristol, which was doing 29, um, and Newcastle, uh, which was only doing 19 cases per year. And this is um, operating on children under one year of age uh, with open heart surgery. Um, and in fact, if you look at the 
graph on the right, what you see is the mortality rates uh, with the 70% confidence limits. I'm not sure why 70% was chosen. And you can see uh, that the two centers with the lowest numbers of operations also had the highest mortality. And this was data um, that was made available to um, the Super Regional Services um, Review Committee. Um, and so they now had data on mortality, but nobody was expressing concerns, and so they didn't need to take any action. You can see that the other, the other centres in the right-hand graph all actually were achieving a very good mortality, and it was probably roughly uh, about half of the Bristol centre. So in 1983, we knew Bristol did not shine as a star. In 1986, we had concerns but no data. And by 1989, the Super Regional Services, working, the Super Regional Services Advisory Committee had data but no concerns. And so they continued to allow Bristol to operate as a centre of excellence. And in fact, uh, in 1990, the year after this, there were three centres that were singled out as requiring review. And they were Bristol, which had low numbers and high mortality, Newcastle, which had low numbers and high mortality, and Harefield, which was at that time becoming part of the joint Harefield-Brompton Centre. And in their paragraph on Bristol, uh, Sir Terence English, who meticulously kept most of the documents that he had used during his time um, uh, at the Royal College of Surgeons uh, suggested that what needed to happen was that they should encourage Bristol Pro Tem and protect it. And he's not sure, um, and he wasn't sure when he was asked why he said this centre needed to be protected, um, because in the same report, as you can see highlighted in yellow, there remained a question mark over the centre's long-term viability in super-regional terms. And that was partly because the local paediatricians were actually voting with their feet and sending patients to other centres in order to get um, paediatric cardiac surgery. With respect to Newcastle, um, Sir Terence English believed that they had to keep it under very careful review. This was important uh, and Newcastle was kept under very careful review and the mortality rates did improve, as we will see. Now, despite these high mortality figures and these low throughput figures, in 1989, Mr Wishart and Mr Dasmana began performing what at that time was probably the most complex paediatric cardiac surgical operation, which was the arterial switch operation. And that was for transposition of the great arteries and um, involved re-implanting coronary arteries um, onto a neo-aorta neo uh, once that had been positioned um, on the, left, the new left ventricle. In fact, the numbers still didn't really improve. Um, 40 operations in 1989 for two surgeons and 39 in 1990 when we still had this minimum number. And with my logbook data, which gave an impression of very high mortality, and you'll see um, a, a bit later on in the talk um, how incessant and how um, relentless the mortality in Bristol was. Uh, and after a 1990 January audit meeting had confirmed the impression that we actually had a high mortality for um, simple operations like the VSD in Bristol. Our mortality um, uh, in Bristol at that time was about 10%. Um, and an annual report which I had received, which was sent out to members of the public, which showed that we had twice the national average mortality, um, I, wrote to, um, uh, I wrote to the chief executive. Uh, and this is the letter um, which, when my daughter first read it, called the RC letter to the chief executive. Uh, and the reason she complained, or thought that it was worth complaining about, was because of this paragraph, um, in which I said um, that the directive to improving quality of patient care should have attempted to address the unfortunate position of the Southwest Regional Cardiac Center's mortality for open heart surgery on patients under one year of age. This, as you may not know, is one of the highest in the country, and the problem should be addressed. Now, this was within, um, well, less than two years of being appointed as a paediatric cardiac surgeon. I was trying to alert the CEO to the issue of high mortality in paediatric cardiac surgery. Uh, the response from the CEO was that um, I was just complaining about trust status and that uh, I shouldn't be a stick in the mud and um, uh, there wasn't really a problem with paediatric cardiac surgery. 
The chairman of the hospital medical committee um, interviewed me and uh, suggested that I'd been manipulated by senior figures in the anaesthetic department in order to stir up um, opposition to um, the proposal for trust status. Um, but uh, in fact, Mr. Wishart called me into his office a week later and told me if I did anything like this again, uh, criticising the performance of the unit outside of the unit, then my career in Bristol uh, would be under threat. And that was a very serious threat to a young consultant in a new city taking up a new job. Um, and I didn't want to follow that route again. In fact, in 1989, Mr. Wishart had undertaken his own analysis of various procedures in paediatric cardiac surgery, and if we look at them in a little bit more detail, um, we'll see that he was aware that for some of the operations in Bristol, even though the numbers were quite small, actually uh, the mortalities were quite high. I think TGA and VSD, twice the national average, Truncus um, uh, was, was probably acceptable, uh, TAPVD again twice the national average uh, and a mortality for VSD and pulmonary stenosis uh, that again showed um, that we were not doing as well as we could. And for VSD uh, for five years we also had a mortality that was um, uh, over twice that of the national average. So as I say, small numbers, difficult to get confidence limits, but certainly data that you might consider was actually something that you would want to be concerned about and maybe wanted to try and improve your performance for some of these operations. By 1991, Bristol still hadn't got to that magic figure of 50 operations under one year of age for each surgeon. And so that meant for 17 years, Bristol's operations were not at the number required and were under half the minimum recommended for maintaining good practice. The interesting thing about that was that the representatives of the Royal Colleges were aware of this, but actually didn't necessarily feel that it was necessary to take any action. By 1992, Phil Hammond, who you heard speaking earlier on this afternoon, was also aware of the problem and from multiple sources, uh, one of which was me when uh, he approached me as a GP trainee in Taunton uh, and I told him about the problems in paediatric cardiac surgery um, because I was hoping he would also not refer to Bristol, um, particularly children who were in the high-risk groups. He, as he said, took on quite a crusading attitude towards Bristol, which he says in retrospect may not necessarily have been the correct approach, uh, but he publicised the fact that Bristol was known as the killing field and also um, that for, uh, trunk, uh, sorry, for tetralogy of fallow, um, the Bristol mortality was between 20 and 30 per cent, whereas the mortality in some other centres that was known was actually uh, much, much lower. Um, in fact, the pub Private Eye article was read by um, uh, um, some parents who had a child who was going to have a tetralogy of fallow operation. And so they wrote to um, the Secretary of State for Health, who was Virginia Bottomley, and said, should we send our child to Bristol to have the tetralogy of fallow operation? And she sent the letter down the line to the NHS management executive uh, uh, in London and they said, could you please reply to these parents? They sent the letter to, um, to John Roylance in Bristol and said, could you please send a reply to these parents? We don't need to see a copy, but we may need to at some stage. So that at this stage, even the Secretary of State for Health and certainly the Department of Health were aware of concerns about the mortality for paediatric cardiac surgery in Bristol. And, and we really were still in the early stages. I'd also engaged um, the professor of um, anaesthesia in Bristol uh, and convinced him with the data that I had and with my logbook data that actually I believed there was a problem in Bristol. And he had gone to the chief executive um, and said, we really do have a problem uh, and I've got some data now um, and I'd like to show you the data. John Roylance was very much a hands-off manager. He was an ex-clinician, an ex-radiologist and he didn't believe that it was the job of managers to tell clinicians how to do their work. He believed his job was merely to provide the environment in which the information was available. He didn't want to see the data, and he actually said to um, Professor Priest Roberts that he must not show him the data. 
and nothing was done. It's not even known if the chief executive discussed this with the medical director, who by now was, was actually James Wishart. He had been promoted through director of cardiac surgery to become the medical director of the new trust. In 1992, there was a third triannual working party report. And this is table one from that report. Um, and we'll see in a little bit more detail that the mortality for Bristol, which is in red at the bottom, was essentially um, between two and three times that for most of the other centres, except for Harefield. Now, it was known that Harefield was a slightly unusual case at that time because although it reported all of its operations, they were actually referrals from overseas and they came with late end-stage disease and were considered to be outliers for many reasons. But in fact, if you look at the hospitals that were operating on NHS patients, which are those in yellow and Bristol in red, you'll see that Bristol actually... Um, had a mortality that was between two and three times that of the other countries, oh, sorry, that of the other centres. The third working party report was sent to Sir Terence English in the last few weeks of his tenure of the presidency of the Royal College um, and it was um, sent to the committee endorsed by Sir Terence as he was now um, and it re recommended the ongoing designation of all nine centres including Bristol. And it was the same year that Bristol received its charter mark for excellence in healthcare delivery. Uh, a week after, so three weeks after he'd endorsed the report, and a week after he had um, stepped down as president of the Royal College of Surgeons, Sir Terence English received a letter from Dr John Zorab. He was the medical director of French Hospital, and I had spoken to him about nine months earlier expressing my concerns about the outcomes for paediatric cardiac surgery. And Sir Terence received this letter in which John Zorab raised the delicate and serious problem of mortality and morbidity following paediatric cardiac surgery in Bristol. Great anxieties were being expressed by some of his colleagues, some of John's colleagues at the Royal Infirmary. And he said that there was a widespread feeling that the situation is well recognised but being ignored possibly because no one knows how to tackle it. And Sir, and Sir Terence, uh, after he read the report, went back to table one in the working party report and he noticed Bristol's high mortality. So he now has concerns and he now has data and he uh, contacts um, Professor Hamilton um, and uh, Professor David Hamilton, who was the chairman of the working party, um, and they decide that they would take executive action as the president and the chairman of the working party to actually de-designate Bristol as a centre of excellence. Um, and uh, Sir Terence wrote to Norman Halliday um, the day before he went on a three-week break to Pakistan. He said, although I was aware that Bristol was not one of the best paediatric cardiac surgical centres, I had not appreciated that the situation was as serious as described by John Zorab. It's clear from a review of Table 1 in the report that their mortality statistics for both the infant age group and the older age group is worse than any other centres. David Hamilton agrees that sufficient attention was not paid to this by his working party and that the college does not support the inclusion of Bristol as a designated centre of excellence. And he was sure that this was the right course of action and he set off to Pakistan the next day confident that Bristol would now be de-designated as a paediatric cardiac surgical centre of excellence uh, and that children's lives would probably be saved as a result. For Sir Terence, the problem had been solved uh, and then unfortunately, while he was away, Sir Keith Ross and David Hamilton um, had another telephone conversation and David Hamilton wrote to Sir Terence, um, although he didn't receive the letter until he returned from his holiday, and said he was not entirely happy about the agreement to take presidential and chairman's action over the working party report. And there was further a feeling that the de-designation of one of the units would probably leak out in the course of time. And it might become known that they had actually de-designated a centre on the basis of its performance, which they didn't want to happen. They didn't want that to be known. So they decided that what they would do is actually de-designate all of the units so that the status quo was maintained. And this was partly 
to ensure that the rapport and trust between the DOH and the college was not compromised, as it might have been by the suggestion of de-designation of one of the units. And in fact, uh, after this, um, uh, Sir Terence uh, admitted that he should have followed it up, uh, and I think it probably led to the death of something like 30 to 40 children. In 1993, Andy Black, who was a senior lecturer in the department in Bristol and I, had completed an audit of um, five years of pediatric cardiac surgical data. And again, we'd shown it to Professor um, Priest Roberts, and uh, he had gone to John Roylance and said, this is really quite uh, significant data. It shows very high mortalities compared to other centers in the UK. And uh, he believes that he said to John Roylance, that this was not something that we should sweep under the carpet. At the same time, um, or very shortly after our data was available, I had said to Sheila Willits, who was a vice president of the Royal College of Anesthetists, that I wanted to report the unit to the GMC for poor outcomes. And within 48 hours, Sheila had arranged for a solicitor um, from the GMC uh, to contact me. And his response was, um, firstly, you can't report a unit to the GMC, you have to report a doctor. But no doctor had ever been reported to the GMC for poor performance, and he didn't believe it would ever happen, uh, and it wasn't something that he would want to follow up. If my complaint was not upheld, he reminded me, then the person who I had accused of poor performance could counterclaim for serious professional misconduct as my claim would have been bringing their reputation into disrepute. And he believed that even if my complaint was approved by the lay screener to go to the GMC, the only way the GMC would investigate my complaint was through the three wise men procedure. And he said, have you heard of the three wise men? And I said, yes. He said, do you know what the process is? And I said, well, no, I'm not entirely clear. He said, well, what happens is that the General Medical Council will contact the medical director of the hospital. The medical director of the hospital then becomes one of the three wise men, and he has to appoint the head of the unit that is being complained about in order to investigate the complaints about that unit. They have a consultant psychiatrist, but the consultant psychiatrist is only to adjudicate on whether the person who is being accused of poor performance is, an addic is, a, is, a, is addicted to narcotics, has florid psychosis, or is suffering from alcohol addiction. And that's all the consultant psychiatrist can do. So the situation would have been, and could not have been varied, that Mr Wishart would have been sitting and adjudicating his own performance. And the solicitor reminded me that not only was it unlikely that he would see that he was performing badly, actually he would then actually squash the case and I would be sued for bringing his reputation into disrepute because an allegation would have been made which was not upheld by the GMC. So this route was actually not available to me in order to get the GMC to look at the performance uh, of the unit or of Mr Wishart. In 1994, um, because I was an adult um, cardiac surgical um, audit uh, anaesthetist, I was auditing the results in Bristol and also in some of the other units through um, the Association of Cardiothoracic Anaesthetists, and I was sitting on a committee that was looking at the audit of all ad adult cardiac surgical procedures in the UK. And I met a Department of Health official called Peter Doyle. Um, we, uh, we used to meet, uh, and Bruce Keogh was one of the people uh, on this committee as well, and because Bruce and uh, I were actually, um, we used to get cheap day return tickets, and so after the meetings finished, before our trains were leaving Paddington and Euston, we used to sit in a pub in Warren Street, and I used to tell him about my problems in Bristol. And he didn't have much in the way of solutions. He said he would speak to Bill Braun, who was a well-known pediatric cardiac surgeon in Bristol who was very good at pediatric cardiac surgery um, and we decided that what we needed to do was actually get um, Peter Doyle to come down to visit us in Bristol uh, and so we arranged for Peter uh, to come down um, 
Uh, six, cardiac anaesthetist by now had written to the director of anaesthesia about the arterial switch program because we were so worried about neonatal arterial switches. Um, and the D Department of Health, through Peter Doyle, raised their concerns with the trust and they agreed to appoint a new surgeon and to improve facilities. And at that stage, as far as I was concerned, the problem had been solved. It had cost a few lives, probably more than a few lives, and it had involved several people in authority in the UK. Two presidents of the Royal Colleges, a president of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, president of the Cardiac Society, CEO of the hospital, all of these people knew that there had been a problem and it had cost lives in Bristol. However, the problem was solved until December 1994 when uh, a child called Joshua Loveday was scheduled for an arterial switch operation in January of 1995. And Gianni Angelini, who was the professor of cardiac surgery in Bristol, and I uh, expressed serious concerns for the safety of this child. We believed that if this operation proceeded, um, Joshua's life would be in danger. We contacted the CEO, we contacted the medical director, Mr. Wishart, we contacted the Department of Health through Peter Doyle, I actually spoke to Bill Braun. Bill Braun at this stage had been retraining Jannard and Dasmana who was planning to operate on Joshua. Um, and uh, Bill Braun had said to me over the course of several telephone con conversations, firstly, uh, that he didn't believe Jannard had the skill to do the operation, but secondly, I couldn't tell anybody that he believed that because he had a, a surgical retraining program uh, in which American, German, French and English surgeons were coming to him for advice on retraining and therefore his name had to be kept out of this, arg of this discussion. So I knew that Janardin shouldn't do the operation and I knew that Janardin's retraining specialist and mentor knew he shouldn't be doing the operation um, but uh, he, he still wanted to proceed. And on the Monday, three days before the operation, I rang Bill Braun and said, this operation is still scheduled to go ahead. Um, and Bill Braun said to me, I've spoken to my wife. She believes that if this operation proceeds, it will be immoral. Will you give me the phone number of somebody at the Department of Health I can ring to stop this operation? And I said, uh, yes, I'll give you Peter Doyle's phone number. And I gave him the phone number, and I know that he rang him that afternoon. On the day before the operation was scheduled, there was a last minute meeting organized uh, at which Gianni Angelini, the professor of cardiac surgery, was excluded because he was an adult cardiac surgeon, not a pediatric expert. There were three um, pediatric cardiac anesthetists, um, there were uh, three pediatric cardiologists and two pediatric cardiac surgeons and they all agreed that the data that they were showed, which was relatively small numbers, um, showed that actually Joshua could be safe. I suggested that we had an institutional problem with this operation in Bristol and that our success didn't really allow us to believe that we could safely do this operation. And I also explained that I thought that there would be scrutiny from the Department of Health. And in fact, I was the only person to say that the operation shouldn't go ahead. Joshua died. It took the Department of Health a couple of weeks to get, <coughs> um, to get their letters out. Joshua had died on the 12th, so within two weeks they had written to the Trust and said that since the fatal switch operation on the 12th of January, two more children have had complex cardiac operations, one of whom has died and the other was severely ill. And I think I put that up because that gives you some idea of the frequency with which these children were actually dying in Bristol. They'd spoken to the chief executive and advised him to stop complex neonatal and infant cardiac surgery forthwith. And they now had to hold an independent inquiry. And Mr. Wishart was given uh, carriage of that, of that inquiry. 
So he was making the arrangements for the independent inquiry into his own department and his own practice. And uh, he, he chose uh, Mark de Laval, who was a pediatric cardiac surgeon from Great Ormond Street, and Stuart Hunter, who had been um, at medical school with him. Um, so the Department of Health had contacted John Roylance, who'd gone to m his medical director, who was going to arrange an inquiry into his unit and his practice. And in 1990, well, in uh, February 1995, we were visited by Mark de Laval and Stuart Hunter, and we were shown a copy of the first report that they produced. And penciled across it was written damage limitation. And the conclusions that um, Stuart and Mark de Laval um, had come to was that um, consultant one uh, was actually um, reasonably uh, competent um, and uh, sorry, consultant two was reasonably competent, that consultant two would certainly compare very favourably with the best UK institutions, but consultant one would be amongst the high risk, uh, higher risk surgeons. So external e inquirers had now confirmed the evidence that we had produced, um, which was suggesting that there was high risk surgery going on in Bristol, uh, and this had been confirmed in writing. The report was made available to the paediatric cardiac and adult cardiac specialists and over two nights we went through the report uh, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, and we all agreed with every one of the conclusions, including the conclusions about a higher risk surgeon. Uh, and there were no objections. Until the chief executive came back uh, from his holiday and concluded that he wanted another report which wasn't quite as critical of the hospital. And the second report said that members of the anaesthetic department, by and large, claimed that the mortality and morbidity were excessive. The tension which has arisen from this long saga has created an atmosphere of distrust and lack of confidence, which has made the working conditions for the surgeons very difficult indeed. It would only be possible for the surgeons to carry on if they received the full support they deserve from their colleagues and that requires a change of attitude to alleviate the stressful conditions under which they've had to work. So we've now turned a surgical problem into an anaesthetic problem and we can safely blame the anaesthetists for the high mortality. Despite the hospital's agreement to cease complex operations which they'd been told by the Department of Health, Mr Wishart continued to perform open heart surgery and in fact, his last operation was on the 7th of, day, 7th of May, which was the week that um, Ash Pawadi, the new paediatric cardiac surgeon, arrived. And um, this is a quote from the letter uh, that they had sent to the Department of Health saying that they would cease paediatric cardiac surgery, uh, but the patient Matthew Ke Peacock that Mr Wishart operated on on the 7th of May uh, died uh, about three weeks later. In 1986, I moved to Australia, um, and in that year, I wrote to the GMC when I had a contract for five years, re reporting what I believed was persistent poor outcomes in paediatric cardiac surgery. It was the first letter, in fact, it was the only letter the GMC ever received from a doctor um, into the Bristol affair, and they decided to investigate paediatric cardiac surgery. In fact, they'd received more than 30 complaints from parents over the years, but they hadn't decided that any of them actually want, warranted any investigation. In 1996, in the same year, a report by Nick Black, who was an epidemiologist at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Me Medicine, Tom Treasure, who was a pediatric cardiac surgeon, uh, sorry, who was an adult cardiac surgeon at St George's Hospital, and Ken Taylor, who was an adult cardiac surgeon at the Hammersmith, um, uh, investigated Mr. Wishart's adult cardiac surgery. And they concluded that his mortality was nearly five times higher than his colleagues in Bristol. There was no national comparator data, but they used the data available in Bristol to make this comparison. And that was a risk-adjusted, independent, expert analysis carried out at the request of Gianni Angelini. In 1998, the GMC inquiry concluded that all three doctors were guilty of serious professional misconduct uh, and uh, they decided 
to erase Mr Wishart and Mr Roylance's name from the medical register. Janardin was required to retrain in paediatric cardiac surgery. The GMC inquiry was followed by a public inquiry by Ian Kennedy and that it confirmed an excess mortality of between 30 and 35 children under one year of age between the years of 91 and 95. Other estimates have suggested that over 100, well, that 170 children died in Bristol that would have survived if they had been operated on in centres with average performance. That figure has never been disputed. And at least four of the parents of the children operated on in Bristol have committed suicide. The solicitor who took most of the cases to court uh, and the National Health Service Litigation Authority has actually um, defended uh, stoically every case in Bristol. They've never settled any of the cases, and he's estimated that the legal costs alone were over £100 million. Bristol, in fact, uh, didn't have to be as bad as it was. The red line here is the mortality rate for Bristol, um, and it shows that in the year I left, in 1996, mortality was already beginning to come down. In 1998, the first papers on clinical governance were written, um, and it indicates that this was the response to the performance of paediatric cardiac surgery in Bristol. So for me, there are lessons to be learnt. Uh, I think uh, the, the most important one is the one that Phil Hammond uh, provided this afternoon, which is, how can we stop this happening again? And the answer is, we have to make sure that we always keep the patient in sight. We must never lose sight of our patients. And if we do that, then my feeling is, we will actually always have a safe service. Thank you. Thank you.